comparing anything to what Alan Moore's doing falls flat. <laughs> you know, I'm the guy who followed him on Swamp Thing, right? So I know this, that the guy's so good. And it's all order, but you, you did it though. Yeah, I did it, but I, I'm just saying. Welcome back to the Comics Cube, everyone. Rick Veach is back, and we're going to talk about. Uh, first, we're going to talk about Panel Vision. Uh, how are you? Um, I'm real good. How are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, panel Vision. Uh, for those of for the people viewing this who don't know what Panel Vision is, would you mind telling us what your elevator pitch is for it? Well, I'm not really good at elevator pitches, but um, essentially, it's creating comics that utilize one panel per page. Mm -hmm. So the book, it's still comics, it's still comic books, but it's kind of like a different way of reading, uh, creating comics and hopefully for the reader uh, experiencing comics. I had been working with uh, the Amazon Prime uh, Kindle program which is like a uh, print on demand program. And uh, I realized the way the pricing of the books were that you could put together like a 108 page book for the same price that you put together a 40 page book. It sounds crazy, oh, wow. but that's how they price it per unit. And so, yeah, so it, it allowed me to expand the possibility of what this, the book could be. I'd been inspired years ago by a book I'd seen in Italy uh, by Jodorowsky and Moebius called The Eyes of the Cat. I don't have a copy of it, but I'm, I'm sure the viewers, a lot of viewers will know. It. Uh, it wasn't a commercial project. It was done as a gift to the friends of the publisher, the humanoids. Um, and it instantly became this collector's item because they only printed like 2000 of them. So I, I got to see it in 1981 or something in, in Italy. And uh, I was like, you know, I want to work like that someday. And Panel Vision has allowed me to do it. Um, that's awesome. Because uh, when I read the descriptions for Panel Vision, it was just saying, uh, Rick Veach is, you know, Rick Veach is using the medium and pushing it to new boundaries. And then I saw that you were doing it one page at a time. And you know, one panel per page. And then I thought one panel per page and pushing the boundaries of the medium, how's that gonna work? Cause you basically uh, remove the concept of a layout. But then I got it on my Kindle and I was actually wondering that, I was actually wondering that, did you optimize it for the Kindle? Because I feel like it's a different reading experience um, on the tablet. That, that's exactly the point. It's a different reading experience. It's comics, it's pure comics but it's different than what we were used to. And, and it, it, by taking away the page layout, it kind of asks the reader to linger yes. on each panel and spend a little more time. And so as the artist, as the creator, I'm trying to work things in to the panel, subtle things, clues, um, you know, anything I can get in there that'll, that'll give the thing a little more depth and a little more width and uh, I think it works. Yeah, there's been five panel vision books so far, uh, Super Catchy, Otzi, Redemption, A Spotted Stone, and your latest one is Tombstone Hand. Um, right. They're all, uh, they're all quite, you're known for, you know, you're known for your love of dreams. Uh, those are all, those all kind of follow dream logic. Is that, the, the, am I correct in that <laughs> assessment? Not really. I mean, there is some dream logic in there, especially in uh, Redemption and Super Catchy. But um, I think Otzi and Spotted Stone and uh, Tombstone Hand all work as stories. They're like little yeah. singular parables. The idea is that you give someone in, in the course of just a book, that's all you get. There's no ads, there's no other stories, there's nothing else. It's an experience unto itself. And I, I like that feeling that I can give somebody that. I've always wanted to ask this, where did you get, uh, you know, where, who influenced you to do that inking style that you have with the very thick lines, very thick, expressive lines? Um, probably Joe Kubert. 
um, I studied at the Kubert School. I was, you know, part of that first year class with Bassett and Tottleman and Yates and those guys. And so Joe had an extreme influence on me, kind of breaking out of how I was working at the time, which was essentially, you know, thinking like Jack Kirby and, and making me look at real illustrators and understand the methods and materials of brush and pen. Uh, I have to say both, uh, or all three, Tottleben, Bissett, and Yates, you know, working with them one-on-one, -on -one, I learned a lot too, because all three of them are masters of the pen and ink skill. And uh, I really appreciate the way that you can cartoon as well, the way that uh, you can go from realistic to cartoony is uh, very versatile. The thing that I noticed about Tombstone Hand when I was reading it, um, compared to the to the other panel vision books, um, it's the one that I thought it, it kind of at first gives the impression of being a more straightforward story than the other ones. And then it goes off into, you know, a, a, a more a more insightful discussion about, uh, you know, life and what comes after. And I thought that was very interesting. Are these the question? Are these questions that you continually ask yourself, and you always want to explore? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, the great mystery of life. I mean, that's why we're here. <laughs> so, um, I think with uh, Tombstone Hand, when I began the book, um, all I really had was the idea of a standoff in a grave, where one guy's in the grave, he's wounded, and there's another guy outside the grave with a rifle, and so. You know, I wanted to explore that kind of standoff. How would the guy in the grave get out? And that's, you know, the story itself kind of evolved organically. That's another aspect of working in panel vision is that for most of them, I work on one panel a day. Oh, really? I don't. Yeah. And I don't really know what's going to happen next, but I'll finish the panel. And then the rest of the day and into the first part of the next day, I'm thinking about the possibilities. Well, what if I went this way with it? And what if I did this? And what if I did this? I know I got to go over here, but it allows the thing to grow organically, almost like a plant. Mm -hmm. And um, as, a, as the creator, it kind of, I'm in a sort of trance, I think is the word for it, where I'm in that story and I'm feeling my way through all possibilities to get to the best you know, thing that it can be. So you didn't script this out or or no. do anything. That's uh, so when you do something like Redemption, um, where it's you know the comic and then just a word underneath. So that's all stream of consciousness, would you say? Well, it's daily panel. Mm -hmm. Like each day, I did a panel, and with with Redemption, I knew I wanted to do a story that where a guy fell asleep and had a dream. And then in the dream, he fell asleep and had a dream. And then within the, that dream, he fell asleep. So it was a dream within a dream within a dream. Everything else is just sort of psychedelia. Is there a common, I've noticed another common thing among uh, the five panel vision books. It's, it's kind of a theme about isolation. You like to explore, uh, you know, people who are kind of on their own. Is this a conscious thing or? It's not a conscious thing, but it's probably how I live. Um, you know, we live up on a mountaintop and uh, you know, we're kind of isolated. So I'm not in an urban area very often. Um, you know, I'm a country person. So isolation is kind of how I live. And that, I guess that, that goes, uh, that shows in your work. In Tombstone Hand, how, do you fe how did you come up with the idea of the third character who, you know, gets shot and basically has one foot in the grave and one foot uh, not in the grave throughout the whole story just comes back later well it was like i i grew him you know yeah. you, you open the book and it's four panels of a shadow moving across the barren landscape and that's how i entered into it as i was drawing those panels i was thinking who is this guy what's he doing why is he going here and day by day i would build the story i knew i was going to get to the grave mm -hmm. but how I got there, I didn't know. And what happened afterwards, I didn't know. As the writer and the artist of all these books, um, do you even still pencil? Or do you just go straight um, to ink? 
Well, uh, working with the Cintiq is how I work now digitally mostly. Okay. Except when I'm doing commissions, then I work back with pen and ink. But with a Cintiq, you can go right from layouts to inks because you can correct any mistake immediately. So, you know, why not? You know, it saves like a third of the of time, you know, doing it. So it's a really good system. You've been in the industry for, you know, you know around <laughs> over 40 years at this point. Um, and how did these tools, how, how have these tools influenced the way that you, you know, your style has changed, your working process has changed? Well, you've I've always, always been, kind of been an early adopter. Yeah, well, maybe that, but I've also always been um, uh, an artist that used photos, reference. You know, my studio used to be filled with tens of thousands of reference books because if I needed a tank, I wanted it to look like a real tank. And if I needed a horse, I'm not a good horse drawer. So I would, you know, have a book of horses that I could sort of swipe and stuff. Now working digitally, I don't need the books because I've got another screen right next to me with Google and virtually anything I need, I can find and get it, the detail, visual details of it correct. It also works really well with, um, you know, setting up a, uh, you know, how the body's going to pose or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can find all kinds of cool action poses just by, you know, calling up on Google soccer match. Oh, wow. And you'll find all these guys, you know, jumping around and, you know, doing all this crazy stuff. And you can turn that into an action scene. You know, oh, turn wow. those, those, those poses into an action scene. Really cool. And it has a has like a lifelike feel to it that I couldn't get on my own. I've never thought of, uh, I've never thought of actually doing, you know, transposing one image in one context into, uh, you know, another context altogether. That's very interesting. Um, so I bought, uh, panel vision books. I bought all five of them because, uh, on my Kindle, I was going to buy them on paper. And then I realized the shipping would murder me, but yeah. I don't regret buying it on the Kindle because I feel like there is something to the fact that every time I turn the page, um, the next image would automatically, would automatically, you know, occupy the same space. Yeah. And, I, I felt like it was moving. I felt like it was both a comic and I guess maybe a piece of animation. Yeah, that, yeah, I can see what you mean. Where, you know, panel by panel by panel, it moves. That's that's a good thought. I mean, it does fit in with a digital environment, although it's kind of a quick read. Um, but yeah. the, my hope is that people go back and reread the books because it, like I say, there's little clues and little subtle things that are put there in the background and then, uh, how the characters act and stuff that are worth make it worthwhile i believe to go back and reread them i agree they, they reward rereading um why do you think it's been difficult for for some artists to or even well my tablet just dropped how do you think uh why do you think it makes it difficult for a writer for some companies and some artists to kind of transition completely to you know to tr transition to the digital format um you see probably because it, 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 a lot of a lot of the problem is age i think you know like i'm a you know baby boomer i'm pushing 70 years old and our, my generation has a hard time like learning software mm -hmm. and keeping up with software and dealing with the frustrations daily frustrations of like doing your art on a computer um, i've been able to adopt to it because i started early but you know a lot of my friends still don't you know and god bless them because they're brilliant pen and ink people and you know they should they should be working analog but for me as a production artist and uh just because i enjoy the feel of it i mean running with stylus over the glass boy it feels great and there's a lot less impact on the wrist which is an issue as you get old and you've, you've drawn six thousand pages um <laughs> You know what? How you're using your wrist and your fingers becomes really important, especially since now you don't have to go on it. You, you don't have to go over it in pencil and then in ink, <laughs> and then a race. And know, then a racing was the hardest one. You know, like you just ruin your wrist. You know, like rrr, rrr, rrr. oh, all the pressure. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've noticed because uh, you headed the uh, the Comic Con website. Um, yeah. Uh, what it must have been twenty years ago now. It started um, you, in 1998. 1998, yeah. So like 23 years ago, you've always kind of been 
at the forefront of these developments. Is that just a mindset or? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm always, as a personal creator, I'm always looking for a creative space to really explore this medium of comics, which I'm just love. Um, and I think when we started Comic-Con and I did it with my partner, Steve Conley, mm -hmm. um, we were looking for a new way to get out there because uh, Diamond and DC Comics had just destroyed distribution for independent books. We had lost the marketplace. You know, they were squeezing everybody out. So we were looking for the ne for the next venue to get it out there, and the internet just happened to happen at that point. And that's I think that's uh, more true than ever now. I think the biggest publisher of comics right now is Webtoon. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. How does it feel uh, being one of the early innovators? of moving uh, comics to digital I, I don't you know think about that i know that it was a lot of work running uh comic-con and the best part of it was that we ran a new site called the yeah. splash and you can't find this on the internet it's all gone now but this is going to tie into our discussion about abc oh okay it was all at the same time we were doing abc comics i was running the splash which is sort of like the drudge report of comics and we were sort of beating up paul levitz and dc comics as we were working for them so it was kind of an odd relationship i went to that website every day back when really? yeah back when you actually had to go to websites instead of waiting for them to pop up on your news feeds yeah to see if they have an update you should have seen the the uh, little tools i had to actually make that it was like this thing where I'd have to like, you know, put in the, the headline and then put in the copy and put in this. And then the next day I'd have to move it all down and put in the next story and then move them down and put in the next story day by day. And now they have templates for that. Oh yeah, it's all, yeah. You know, but it was, it was essentially a blog before there were, there was a term for blogging. Yeah. So you mentioned ABC. Let's move on to ABC. Um, in 1999, uh, ABC launched. Uh, yeah. America's Best Comics. So that was uh, that came out of uh, that came out of the Bruins of Awesome Comics, where you were also working with Alan Moore. Um, right. You you were working with Alan Moore on uh, Supreme um, flashbacks, the flashback sequences for Supreme, um, yeah. and then you now with ABC, you were working with Alan Moore on Gray Shirt, which is a tribute to Will Eisner's The Spirit. So between 1963 Supreme and gray shirt you guys homaged um the silver age marvel the weisinger era superman and uh, as well as the golden age superman and will eisner's the spirit what is it about retro pieces uh, that attracts you um well we lived it you know we bought that stuff on the newsstand when it first came out and when alan and i get on the phone we just wallow in it you know because he's got this memory he can call up like any page he's read from the time he was a little kid and sort of describe the details to you and stuff. And I'm, I'm not quite as good at that, but I, I absorbed all this material. And, you know, we would just get talking for hours sometimes about Kurt Swan, Superman, mm -hmm. and what Eisner did. And, um, and of course, the Marvel stuff. Um, I think Alan, with 1963, more than anybody, defined the modern retro comic. Yeah, he really saw it like when he, he told Steve and I, Bassett and I, what we were uh, going to be doing. We immediately we in, initially thought that it was going to be like a, a, a joke. And that we we should draw sarcastically even. But he was like, no, no, I want it completely straight, you know, and I think the term he used was there was a time when comics were in a state of grace. And that's what we want to do. And so the humor in 1963 is in the ads. But, yeah. you know, the books themselves try to duplicate that exact spirit of, of that time, uh, not only in how they read and look, but the paper stock and how they're colored. You know, so the 63 is kind of like a tactile experience. Mm -hmm. So out of that, um, when Alan went to work for Awesome uh, and he knew he was going to take over Supreme, 
and he knew he wanted to do some retro stuff. He originally approached Kurt Swan to do that material, but Kurt was uh, had health problems and yeah. wasn't able to do it. So, you know, he tapped me, which I was, you know, delighted to to do it. Um, the important element to the awesome stuff, which and which carried over to the ABC stuff, was Todd Klein, the letterer, because we were working at, at, at awesome in all these different time frames. You know, we were doing EC comics, we were doing early Superman comics, we we're doing mid Superman comics, um, everything that, you know, Alan wanted to do. And Todd was instrumental in the design and implementation of authentic lettering, hand lettering that, that just looks perfect. And when Awesome collapsed and Alan was in the wind all of a sudden, um, he wanted to keep that team together because he liked what we were able to do. Um, and uh, it was Hamaj Studios that got to him first. And they, he and Hamaj started to put together that deal. I wasn't really part of the, the deal itself. I was just like the early artist that was attached to it. Yeah, you knew that, you, you could you tell that he was gonna bring you along? Um, well, he just called me one day. Yeah, because you've been friends for a long time at that point. Well, we worked on Swamp Thing together. Yeah. Going way, way, way back. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't odd to get a phone call out of the blue, you know, saying he's got this new project and he sees me as a part of it. And, you know, it's a blast to work with him. So, are you surprised? I'm personal, personally, I was surprised that you didn't, uh, you were not part of the Tom Strong team because Tom Strong to me felt like a direct, you know, lift from Supreme, a, a direct, uh, a direct, it's basically a lateral move. I was surprised that you were not on it. Um, well, it, I don't know. I think it, Tom Strong looks fantastic. Yeah. You know, and um, I don't, my stuff doesn't stand up to, you know, what those guys were doing. Um, but I can do that retro stuff and I can make it look right and I can evoke it. Um, we couldn't quite get the color and the pulp paper that we had with 1963, but you know, I think we carried it forward quite a bit. We kind of defined retro, I think, at that yeah. up to that point. Why do you think uh, some retro comics don't work? Um, there's there was 1963 wasn't the only one or that that was there doing some retro comics. There was a whole line of comics, uh, Big Bang, um, just some other stuff that was coming out, and I just feel like they fell flat. I guess. No, they, they were for me. I think comparing anything to what Alan Moore is doing falls flat. <laughs> you know, I'm the guy who followed him on Swamp Thing, right? So I know this. That the guy's so good. And it's all order, but you you did it though. Yeah, I did it, but I, I'm just saying, like Big Bang might seem like it falls flat, but if Alan Moore wasn't there, you know, working that side of the street, Big Bang would just be like seen as fantastic. Um, <laughs> But the guy's so good. He makes everybody else kind of like, you know, midgets around him. And what, um, he's a he's a fantastic literary mimic. Yeah. That's one of the things that, you know, people don't realize about him. He reads endlessly and he, absor he has his mind that can absorb all this stuff and then bring it up and mimic other writers, which we certainly we saw in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah. But all of retro stuff and... Even the 1963 stuff, when he had to mimic the Stan. new image char characters, oh, know, yeah. he, he, he wrote dumb all of a sudden. You know, it was like <laughs> he really got it. <laughs> um, and uh, would you say that working with Alan brought out the best in you? Oh, always, always. It's you know, it's a real treat and honor to work with him. He is the greatest writer of comics probably ever, and he certainly defined. Uh, the whole era, you know, beginning with Marvel Man, yeah. uh, the modern superhero era. He is the big bang of it. Although his artists, you know, were absolutely important to it as well. Um, I think the tragedy of it is that, and this brings us to ABC, is that the business kind of always worked around him in a negative way and kind of hogtied him in, with the ABC deal that in a really bad way. And here we are today. He he's given up comics. You told me la the last time that um and uh, before I dive deep into ABC, but you told me the last time that in play back in the eighties was 
a possibility of Alan and Dave Gibbons on on Superman and Frank Miller on on Batman. And I, I don't know if it was a possibility. It was just a thought I had. Oh, uh, okay. Because I'm like, if that was true, uh, I don't understand why that didn't happen. Because that was a no brainer. But I think the history of DC. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's DC not seeing the potential. I mean, they, they certainly must have seen what Dave and Alan did on uh, that Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman thing. The man yeah. who has everything. Yeah. I mean, they nailed it. They absolutely nailed it. But um, they had something else in their head. They didn't see the potential. Uh, go Getting to gray shirt, though. Um, as, so the thing about ABC to me was, I, I, I tell everybody who worked in ABC this, when ABC dropped, I, I was down to collecting like two comics and I was already, I think I was like 16 and I was going to give up comics because, you know, other interests, other interests, meaning girls. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, but then ABC dropped and I just couldn't believe that one guy was, was conceptualizing and writing all of this. And yeah. I just thought that was fascinating. But the thing also was that I had recently discovered Will Eisner. Um, and I already known of your work before. Um, so you are basically, I think you were the only artist there whose work I'd actually known before uh, ABC. Um, and I'd already known your work before. So when I saw that you were doing um, a spirit uh, pastiche, I was really very interested. I saw that first sketch that you did with, um, you know, gray shirt reading a newspaper. Yeah. What is it about Will Eisner that's so special? Well, you know, where do you begin? Um, I had the great good fortune to meet Will when I was at Hubert School. He came twice and spoke. And then afterwards, we just got to, you know, hang out downstairs. And uh, he was the first person that ever uh, said the words graphic novel to me. And he, he was telling us flat out, he said, all this superhero stuff is great. You know, it's great entertainment, but it only takes the art form to a certain level and we what you kids need to do in your life is you need to up the game a, a notch and and we need a term to describe comics that are above superheroes mm -hmm. and that's where the, the term graphic novel came from i don't know if he originated it but he was definitely you know pushing it he also laid out uh, this other side to my life which a lot of people don't even know, which is that comics are an incredible informational art form and that they can be used to teach and to uh, advertise and to get information across. He said to us that the American military had done a study in the 50s about the most or the best medium to get information across, and it was comics. And so that's where. Uh, his work with uh, the Pentagon began. He started putting out a magazine called PM Preventive Maintenance or something like that, yeah. working with the, with the Pentagon. So I've taken this to heart in my life. And uh, I, you know, I work with uh, educators and uh, universities and stuff doing comics. And it's, it's done on a uh, better level financially. It pays a lot more than doing, even working for DC or Marvel. Really? Um, yeah. It's like it, it pays commercial art rates, That's which cool. are probably three times what comic book rates are, especially in terms of what you have to give to you know get a page done. Yeah. Uh, comic book rates are pretty measly. Um, and so this kind of has uh, supported me behind the scenes to do things like Spotted Stone and stuff. The stuff I really love is that I can take on a, one of these... Uh, high-end projects you know work hard for two or three months and i can take the rest of the year off and do the kind of comics i want to do yeah this is a common theme i think throughout the interviews that i do is that a lot uh comics don't pay too well so yeah. if you're doing comics you have to really love comics the commercial yeah. art um pays way more yeah but with commercial art you you're pleasing the client mm -hmm. where with Comics, you know, you, you pretty much run wild. You know, the stuff we did with DC and Vertigo, there was very little uh, structure to it. You know, a few things. They want to make sure Superman looks right and Batman looks right, but they were looking for us to be wildly creative and explore ourselves. So it worked really well in that sense. 
And I have to say too, uh, DC Comics had a terrific uh, royalty plan. Okay. So all that material I did in the 80s for DC, I'm still receiving royalties for, which I can't say for any other publisher does that. That's good. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Will Eisner, uh, the spirit of comics, uh, the, the way that, so, you know, he told you that there's more to, to comics and superheroes. How did you feel about that as, a, as obviously somebody who loves superheroes? Well, I'm rig originally an underground comics guy. You okay. know, I came out of the San Francisco thing. My first comic was for Last Gasp in San Francisco. So, I, you know, yes, I worked in mainstream comics, but I was sort of like a, you know, I didn't belong there. I was too crazy and too ready to blow things up. Um, but I found Eisner really inspiring in that sense, that uh, he was uh, always, he saw what we did as an authentic art form that had just emerged in the 20th century. And that we were just taking the first baby steps into what could develop out of that. And certainly we've seen in the last 30 years, um, you know, fantastic uh, approaches to doing comics and, and comics that just, you know, is so much more valuable than yeah. the latest Spider-Man or Batman. And uh, with, with Will Eisner and the spirit, just so much experimentation. I, I wanted to ask like, how does that compare to to riffing on somebody like Kirby in 1963 versus riffing on Eisner in, in Gray Shirt? Well, I don't, I don't know what the difference is. And both of them, you know, just did fantastic work. You know, you can't say that Jack Kirby wasn't imaginative. No, he certainly was. Uh, Eisner was working with a studio. Mm -hmm. So a lot of his stuff was done not by him, but by other people. And I think he made his reputation on kind of like a handful of stories. There's a lot of spirit stories that are just kind of eh, that aren't that good, especially during the war, I think, when he had other well, guys doing, yeah. doing a lot of work. But there's like, you know, maybe 20, 25 stories that are perfect. Absolutely every single word in the right place, perfectly paced. You know, you read that story and you come out the other end and you're like, yeah, that's it. It, it sticks with you forever. And that's what we wanted to be wanted to do. Do you have a for, particular one in in mind when you're thinking about the perfect spirit story? Oh uh, well, there's the one uh, ten seconds in this guy's life, and he's playing the pinball yeah. machine, and then he ends up in the subway. Um, yeah, kill somebody, and the the, the 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 shopkeepers on the floor. You know, he's got he's dying, and he's going, "Oh, you bummer!" You know, it's just like this incredible slice of life stuff. And then it builds to this crescendo where he gets killed, on, you know, with the uh, subway. On the subway the yeah. yeah, that that one is that wasn't as great. I, I read that when I was in high school, and uh, it's like, wow, forties <laughs> comics. I, I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, and then when you did it with gray shirt, um, can you talk about what went into the design of gray shirt? Um, what went into the design? Well, um, Alan envisioned um, cities in the world of ABC. And so, uh, and that he, he asked me to design the technology of uh, Indigo City. Mm -hmm. So I came up with the ideas of, you know, gas powered cars and um, this idea that there was this meteor that had landed and created the bay in Indigo City. Um, little stuff like that, you know, to, to round out the thing. Um, and I, I knew he wanted him in a suit with a hat, but we didn't want him to look like the spirit. So I spent some time trying to figure out, you know, like rather than the domino mask, we'll give him the, you know, the, yeah, the bandana. lower face mask, yeah. which, you know, you can do all kinds of cool things with all kinds of shadowy things under there, wrinkles and things to make it interesting. And then I brought out his eyes. He's like, he's got these really angry eyes and angry brow. Um, and the thing that finally pulled it together was his hat which is not like a big wide brim spirit hat, but it's like a little trilby with a, yeah. a curve to it, you know, and it cocks on his head sideways. And when we had that, it was like, yeah, that's him. And the cane. Yeah. You know, cane, it, we hardly ever used that as a weapon, but it was just something that he would carry around. And he had these little daggers in his shoes that would allow him to jab into a building and climb up the side of it if he needed 
mm-hmm. you know, little things like that. But essentially, he was a guy, you know, just out there fighting crime. I thought the uh, the first uh, issue of Gray Shirt that you did was was incredible, Amnesia, um, because it's one of those things where I didn't see the ending coming. But the second issue that you did, How Things Work Out, that one's a classic. Yeah. How yeah. did you guys do that? <laughs> well, that was Al. It came straight out of He envisioned the whole thing. What's great about him, and I've been on the phone with him when it's happened, you know, he'll call up and go, I haven't got an idea about anything. And we'd start talking about this and talking about that. And all of a sudden he'll go, I got it. And he'll download a, a complete story with dialogue out of his head. It's weird how he does it. And I think that's how, uh, how it all works out happened. He just saw it. Oh yeah, a building, four panels, dot, 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 four time frames, And then he sewed the stories through it. Uh, how hard was it? Um, was it easy or difficult to execute to just make sure? Well, that... The beauty of Alan Moore scripts is he thinks everything out visually. Like he makes a little comic in his in his own notebook before he types it. That's one of his secrets. He sort of lies around and gets stoned and, and, and draws the thing out in his little, you know, scribbly stuff. So he he figures out the visual problems usually. And in the script, he'll spend the time to describe it all to you uh, with the caveat that if it doesn't work, Rick, you know, you figure it out, whatever works for you. But a lot of times it's all there. How often does that, did that actually happen? You've worked with him for a long time since Swamp Thing. Uh, how often did it actually happen that what he wrote didn't work? Oh, I can't think of. Oh, only once. Only once. Um, we did a story with Swamp Thing called My Blue Heaven. Okay. Yeah. You know that story. Swamp Thing lands on this planet in outer space and populates it with Mm -hmm. Constantine and Abby and stuff. And he built to this point where Constantine becomes, or uh, Swamp Thing becomes enraged and rips the Abby creature apart. And I just couldn't do it. I couldn't, you know, he wanted me to make it look like, you know, Swamp Thing was ripping Abby apart into pieces. And I just couldn't do it. Um, and so I ended up having him just knock her head off, which yeah. wasn't quite as bad. <laughs> it's just difficult. Uh, I can imagine that would be kind of traumatic to draw. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all love daddy. And, uh, but, you know, Alan's a, when he writes you a script, it's a complete script with everything thought out. So 1963 was the only exception to that, right? So Right. When that, you that did was Supreme the and Gray Shirt, you were back to full yes. script. Yes. Okay. Uh, did you uh, have a favorite Gray Shirt episode among the first twelve that that you did? Mm, boy, I like them all. I'm, you know, um, I, I think, you know, how things work out has got to be the best one. I think they got nominated for an Eisner on, along the way. Yeah. Um, we also did one with number 12, which was one of those alphabet stories that Eisner would do. A is for this and yeah. B is for that. And it was a it was a, a homage to Will, who had just passed away. Yeah. And I thought that was very that worked out really well too. Yeah, that was for uh the special for tomorrow's story special. Oh right. Number one, yeah. yeah. For number 12, you did a you did a crossover with Cobweb. Right. Yeah. And- you were the first one to do a crossover, I think, with the ABC characters. Um, Possibly, before, I don't know. Before that, we readers didn't even know if they were all taking place in the same world. Ah, that's interesting. We had no idea. Yeah. Because uh, Cobweb and Grayshirt both lived in Indigo City, but they didn't look like the same thing. <laughs> so yeah. we thought it was not, and you know, uh, Cobweb was all over the place. Did you have a favorite character from Grayshirt? that you aside from gray shirt that you- um well it, well remember too it wasn't just the tomorrow stories gray shirt but we also did a graphic novel of gray shirt indigo sunset that's right yeah and which i wrote which is all you that's all me except i got to work with like russ heath dave gibbons uh john severin so david um, lloyd david lloyd right and frank cho yeah yeah. And so that was pretty awesome. And so I, I, you know, that to be able to work with Russ Heath and John Severin, I mean, oh man, my God, yeah. 
how so getting to gray shirt indigo sunset i was actually uh i was actually surprised when i saw it because um i had heard or i had read that tomorrow's stories didn't particularly sell very well is I, i'm not sure would would you say yeah, that was I, true? I, uh, you know that'd be a question for scott dunbeer i don't really know the numbers on it do um, you think uh readers have a have a hard time with anthologies could be could be i know alan loved it yeah you know because it allowed him he's like a uh, you know sandbox play with these toys and uh you know it was a great read because you would get like three stories in a book yeah but um, they, I, they still haven't collected all that stuff either i don't know if that's ever going to happen oh yeah uh, i have them it, but it's not all of them is it uh it doesn't have the specials yeah okay it doesn't yeah. have the the two specials, which is unfortunate, um, and it doesn't have your A to Z um, story in it. Your A to Z story. Um, we, we also did uh, the uh, America's Best Heroes, which I penciled and uh, yeah. Andrew Peepoy inked, and then I did I used the Photoshop big dot coloring style, so that yeah. it really had that you know look of uh, an old comic. I thought that worked out really good. That was fun. I love that one yeah but uh getting getting to indigo sunset um what went into your proposal why did you want to continue to explore gray shirt um well i mean just because we're in the middle of it and it was the potential there was there to do it and so i don't know if um uh, scott you know came up with the idea of like hey we should do a spin-off or if it was me i, I don't really remember um, and but you know you're in the middle of working with these characters. And yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. I'm fascinated by the way that you produced it because all of your covers um, have nothing to do with the main story. You basically have this back matter at the end, which is the newspaper and the newspaper's front page would be about what would happen on the cover. Like what yeah. led to that conceit? Like, cause I was so, so interesting. Um, probably because I didn't know what was going to be in the stories yet when I did the covers. You have to do the covers like a couple of months early. Okay. And so I was looking for a great cover design more than a cover that uh, was, uh, had something to do with the main story. And so then I had, you know, these images like, well, we can make a story out of this. And so it made sense to sort of fit it in the back end. And uh, I think it was also a nice surprise for the readers who actually waded through all that material back there to find out that, oh yeah, it's the cover. Oh yeah. <laughs> cover to cover. Um, and you yeah. were basically not just Eisner, but um, in the first issue itself, well, you see some Dan DiCarlo in there. Yep. Uh, yeah. So where did, where did the conceit to kind of just do a tribute to so many different uh, to so many different comic book artists uh, come from and how do you as an artist manage to just make them look so cohesive because I know you're doing different things but you make them look so cohesive there's a sequence in here that is um, uh, in the first one where you go from you know you go from them looking like a D Dan DiCarlo uh, picture and then the next page um, it's more realistic like how do you manage that kind of transition it's just it's in my genes you know i've absorbed so many comics at this point you know i just have to kind of look at something and go yeah this is how to do it and i'll be able to to you know ape it enough to to get it across and it just fit in with everything we were doing with abc and that we had been doing with awesome was just to explore all these avenues of comics that were being ignored by the main comics uh, I think one of the most important things to understand about ABC is that comics were in crisis right at that time. There had been the collapse of distribution and the comics that were coming out, like the image comics were like really bad. They'd given up even trying to have stories. It was just all these guys standing around, you know, chest puffed out and, you know, stupid stuff. Um, and Alan saw ABC as a remedy to that. He thought, we can build the comics industry back again if there are great comics. And he took it upon himself to solve that problem. And that's part of what ABC was all about. 
what a novel idea. Yeah. And the workload was unbelievable. You know, it was like four titles and I think it was one every two weeks he had to have a script for. He was working with all kinds of artists all over the world. And one of the way he, ways he works with artists is by phone. He calls you up and talks to you, mm -hmm. gets a feel for you. And, you know, of course, he's already familiar with your work. Um, so he was like a really, really overworked guy, you know, doing ABC Comics. The tragedy of it all <laughs> is that Homage sold the contract to DC Comics, mm -hmm. who was Alan's blood enemy at that point. And it put Alan in a horrendous situation that no good came of it, I think, as we can see. Yeah. And uh, he said uh, he didn't want to. He didn't want to screw over the, all the artists who had already signed on, so he just kept. That on. was it. We were, I think, three books in. Um, I think I was working on the third issue at that point, and he brought all these people together, and he felt a responsibility not to pull the rug out from under them, um, and he didn't feel that there was uh, any alternative. Um, although my counsel at the time was like, we should just pull this back and we'll try Dark Horse or one of these other guys and see if we can't, or Image or somebody. But uh, uh, Jim and Scott uh, flew out to England on the day the news broke and they, they were there um, and gave him the news of what they were doing and sort of painted a picture of it that uh, made it agreeable to him to move forward. Um, all, all the promises that were made ended up being baloney once DC had their hooks in him again, though. Um, yeah. And that was a very miserable period for him, uh, not only in the comics, but Warners were making all these films from his stuff. Yeah. And so uh, DC was under pressure from Warners to, you know, control this guy. And of course, you just, you can't control Alan. He's, you know, he's something else completely. But it all ended badly. Um, and uh alan's out of comics i think that alan a has a alan has a reputation on the internet amongst fans and i think the reason he has that reputation is that he's not on the internet to defend himself um well i, I think also he he's um outraged at how he's been treated and when he gives an interview it comes out he's he's pissed off that they did this to him you know and he knows that his worth you know, he's a bankable star who transformed comics. And, uh, and for that, he got, you know, tied up in the spider web of business stuff that he didn't want anything to do. He just wanted to do great comics and to help build the art form out into a beautiful thing. And the businessmen just screwed him over. And uh, just even the story of, um, you know, staying with, with, DC because because he didn't want to screw over the artists I think that kind of thing says a lot about him that doesn't you know that it just gets overlooked by a lot of people who want to judge him for being cranky or grumpy or whatever it is he's a, he's a honest blue collar bloke <laughs> you know and he he has great respect for everybody and uh everybody's work he knows how hard it is to draw comics you know because he tries to do it himself and he never quite made it to that higher level you know to to do things professionally um and his love of the form is real yeah um it's the business end of it that's just been a mess i think uh of all the abc books i think his love of the form just the form of just the whole experimentation with layouts and everything i think that came uh that was most obvious in both promethea and in gray shirt um it's, it's in swamp thing too you know, yeah. he would take every page and try to figure out a new way of laying out a comic. So you get the script and it would be the, all this new, these new, fresh ideas. So, you know, this, this is something that's been part of him. Even so time. early on, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And even in uh, even in something like V for Vendetta or Watchmen, I feel like even when he's not or, or from hell, even when he's sticking to a grid, it's still kind of an innovative way to use the grids. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, here's a story for you. In 1981, I was in uh, Italy at a comics festival and I met Dave Gibbons. First time, you know, we were both young men okay. and he gave me a, a handful of 2000 AD comics to read, which I had in my hotel room. And, you know, I looked through them all and there was one story in there 
that knocked me out. And it was told backwards in time. Is it the reversible so, man? Yeah, something like that. I don't there was if that was the title or not. But I didn't remember who wrote and drew it, right? But I remembered that story. It was like Will Eisner level of story. And I said, someday I'm going to swipe that. I'm going to keep it in the back of my head. So you fast forward to the mid late 80s. I'm on the phone with Alan. He calls up. And he's like, I don't have any idea. We need an idea for a story, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I said, wait, I, re I read this story one time that was told completely backwards. And Alan said, oh, you like that? And it was him. It was before Alan Moore was famous. It was like he had knocked my socks off with this story out of the blue. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so we're getting back to Indigo Sunset. I thought it was really interesting that you, because uh, I don't imagine that the first 12 episodes of Gray Shirt were all meant to tie in together. Were they? No, no, they're meant to be like slice of life stories, urban slice of life stories that Gray Shirt, like the spirit is just peripherally part of. And so we, we meet all these people living in Indigo City and, and going through some sort of you know, comic book story and, and gray shirt might show up at the end or in the middle um, where uh, Indigo Sunset was meant to flesh out gray shirt to give him an origin per se. And, uh, you know, just a, a reason for why he's crime fighting. And you ended and up course, fleshing out the whole world. Of gray well, shirt. that was it. I had those 12 stories to begin with. And so I tied them together and in any way I could and brought and develop characters that were in one story and tied them in with characters and other stories. So it's kind of like a, you know, spider web of, of stuff. How much of that puzzle did you figure out before you wrote the book? Um, there was an outline, which I typed out, but um, one of the great things about comics is, is that trance I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You're in the middle of making a comic book. You're in a weird creative trance. That's really neat. And you're, you've always got it in the back of your head. You're driving down the road. And what if Gray Shirt met Cobweb and did this? What if they were lovers? And that all of a sudden opens this whole story or uh, a, a, you know, some sort of plot twist that you can add to an existing story. It's really fun. You know, I, I gotta say, I'm, I feel like I'm blessed to have been able to do this my whole life. I'm. I was really kind of blown away because I got this in the trade paperback, which is great cover, by the way. I love this cover. Like Thank anytime you. you do a the whole blinds thing as the shadows thing, I think yeah. it's always uh, it's always great. Um, so each issue starts off with a one page gray uh, black and white sequence. Yeah. And at first, for the first three issues, I think, oh, it's this gray shirt helping out uh, a random passerby or whatever, a random newsstand person or. Um, and then later on, as you as you go, you realize that they are actually people in the in the main story. Uh, do you Aged. feel satisfaction in uh, pulling that kind of magic trick? Yeah. Well, I hope that readers are, stick around long enough to, to take it in, because some readers they pass it, they just blow right through it. Um, it's too subtle for them. But you know, I, I always love to like you know three issues in have the reader go aha. That's what he's doing. Yes. You know and uh, so is there at any point in Gray Shirt where you stopped actively trying to channel Will Eisner? Um, and just became its own I thing? I think there's always part of it. It's always, it's always got Will there. You know, and Will's one of the foundation stones of comics and storytelling and graphic novels. So... But as you can see, I was spreading out. It's it's a gangster comic. Mm -hmm. I mean, there hasn't been a gangster comic in a long time. Not a so long time, yeah. you know, I could like I went back and um, I found this DVD with like hundreds of old gangster comics on it, and I was able to, you know, read them all and, and feed that into it as well. Yeah, I see people like Matt Baker in your work, in uh, especially in the second issue. Another thing that I thought was fascinating was, despite the fact that it is a realistic gangster comic that just happens to have sci-fi in it. You use ghosts. And uh, there's a sequence here that I thought was very fascinating. Um, it's when, uh, yeah, it's this one. 
All right. Yeah. He's like outside of the story. He's like outside of the story. Um, he's haunting the story. And at one point he sticks his hand in and pushes a book and freaks out the character. Yeah. Pushes the book. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. Like, how do you come up with that kind of thing? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Cannabis. <laughs> I guess. Uh, we should mention, though, we should mention that um, people who would like this book, if they go to my website, rickbeach.com, I have it for sale because they sent me a, a box of these. Really? So anyone, anyone needs, needs one, just go to my website. Awesome. So, and, and then of course you have um, these, uh, these guest features, these backup features in Indigo Sunset that you mentioned. Um, you got David Lloyd, Dave Gibbons, uh, Frank Cho, Russ Heath, uh, John Severin. And uh, yeah. specifically for the one with Russ Heath, uh, you were yeah. poking a lot of fun at uh, Roy Lichtenstein. Yeah, well, I mean, Lichtenstein is such an important person in the art world. Mm -hmm. and uh the fact that he a lot of his stuff came from russ is undeniable so yeah did that always bug you um it, it originally it did but i'd come more and more to appreciate lichtenstein what lichtenstein did um he is the first person to take a comic book panel and put it on a wall and so he forces you to look at the panel and when you look at the panel, without consciously thinking about it, you know that there's a story leading up to it, and there's a story going out the other end to an ending. So it carries this ghost story with it. And it makes it kind of marvelous. Um, and you could actually apply that thinking to any painting after you've seen Lichtenstein. You look at, look at the Mona Lisa. You know, what's the story? How did she get there, sitting there? And what happened to Mona Lisa afterwards? So it adds a whole new dimension to painting, yeah. in, in my mind. Um, I have that with they, Nighthawks. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, having studied with Joe Kubert, I got to hear some stories because Lichtenstein actually reached out to the war comics artists back in really? the early 60s. Yeah. This is a fantastic story. Um, he was beginning to be famous and they were putting on a big gallery show and <clears throat> he invited the DC comics war artists to come to the show. And that was Joe Kubert, Russ Heath, Irv Novick, um, Mort Drucker maybe. And so they get to the show and Roy Lichtenstein and Irv Novick look at each other and go, you, and they knew each other. They'd been in the army together in a sign painting unit back in Japan at the end of the war. So Roy Lichtenstein was swiping his old sergeant. <laughs> didn't know it. <laughs> so he reached out. So he, he, he knew he was swiping them. Yeah, yeah. He, he knew it. He tried to apologize. He, he did a, um, a talk to the National Cartoonist Society trying to explain what he was doing. And he said, you know, I'm not trying to steal from you guys, but this thing took off. You know, I have to follow it through now. I'm, you know, it's making millions of dollars and stuff. And they understood because they were all commercial artists and they were hoping that they could make that step up with what they were doing to the gallery scene, but none of them were able to do it. But That's you know, I, I think Lich Lichtenstein, there's something very positive about what he did for comics. That's a perspective changer for me because I think I've always just kind of seen him as a guy who swiped and made money off of other people's work. No, I, I think he, I think he had a lot going on up here, and he just fell into that one. And he's part of this pop art thing, and you've got you know Andy Warhol doing like a Tide box or a Brillo pad box, and it's just empty. There's nothing to it. Where a comic book panel, there's something to it. Yeah. He's bringing you an emotion. He's bringing you the synthesis between words and pictures. Um, and also just that weird campiness of, of old romance comics and, and war comics. Yeah. So I think he, he, he did a good thing. Did you, um, so working with uh, all of these guests art, guest artists, uh, I have a really random question here. How come Dave Gibbons did not draw? And he, um, he, he wrote... And you drew i think it was because we were in a bar somewhere 
And I just said, write me a story. And we, we, he came up with this idea on, as we were hanging out in the bar. And so it was like, yeah, write the script. And we, we put the whole thing together. And how did it feel, uh, you know, doing, uh, doing stuff with John Severin? Oh, man, you know, yeah. the guys are the greatest. And, you know, I've been looking at his stuff since EC Comics days. Yeah. And extraordinary uh, period artist. When I was at Kubert School, uh, Joe was publishing a magazine called Sojourn with these full, it was like this big when you opened it up, the pages, like a big newspaper thing. And Severin was doing this Western and we got to see the original art and work with it and as we were doing the production of the book. And it was just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. There's a particular issue, I think it's the third issue of um, Gray Shirt Indigo Sunset that's told in song. Yeah. Uh, do you have a do you have a background in songwriting at all or did was that a f first for you no but, um but i like old time music and mm -hmm. what jumped out at me were my lead characters were frankie and johnny and yeah. so i was like well, I, I could just rework the old frankie and johnny were lovers into frankie and johnny were partners and I, you know i stretched it out from there and um with and, and then you also had all of the back matter that i thought was very interesting and um there's i thought it was very rewarding but the comic strips in the back yeah <laughs> you were just going you were just having a, a ball here yeah it, they had to be done quickly because there wasn't a big budget for the back material yeah i can't remember what i was paid but for the, to package the whole thing it was it wasn't a big payment so um I would have to knock those out like really quickly. And that, that became part of the joke was that, you know, what is this? And the fact that we could bring in weeping gorilla, you know, was, it was a, a nice touch too, I thought. Yeah. The weeping gorilla one was the first time I was like, wait, maybe they are all in the same universe. Right. Right. Uh, I actually had an argument with my brother asking if, um, if uh, the talking duck, no, the chuckling duck and weeping gorilla were having a conversation. <laughs> um, i don't think we're meant to but you know if you, yeah. you want to read it that way you know? there's this one here where uh he says you just can't get a good cup of java in this town anymore and chuckling duck is like substance substance free is the only way to be <laughs> there you go <laughs> oh completely random connection <laughs> you know that's comics right you can you can do that if you want to um yeah. and moving on to the tomorrow story special um specials you have a story in each of the Tomorrow Story specials. This is basically um, where ABC ends. The first one is the Eisner tribute. Uh, yeah. He had just passed away. How, how meaningful was that for you guys to, to work on? Oh, well, you know, I mean, he, he was like the king of comics, you know, uh, although Jack Kirby was too, but um, he was such an inspiration to all of us. And uh, it came as a shock because he was so active right into his 80s that when he died, it was just like, wait, what you know, he can't be gone. You know, it's impossible because he was, he was like the grandfather of all of us. Brilliant, brilliant man. He was still working on the plot, I think, or he had just finished the plot, his last book when when he passed. Yeah. And with no degeneration in his art quality, it yeah. was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that last um, that last panel in that Eisner tribute that you did, which is uh, him drawing under Wildwood. I thought that was uh, mm -hmm. very touching. No, well, thank you. Um, and then you managed to close off ABC basically, because aside from the A to Z books, uh, th those were the last things that Alan did, I think for, for ABC. Uh, you closed it off with the America's Best Heroes. Yeah, uh, and that was a blast. You know, um, we were kind of thinking Wally Wood. Yeah. We, when he wrote the script, and I, you know, I did Wally Wood as best I could, but then we brought in Andrew Peepoy, who just nailed it with the inks. I thought, <clears throat> and by then I'd figured out the, how to Photoshop, you know, big dot color so it looked really authentic. And, uh, you know, we were able to make it look really great. I was really happy with that. That was one of those things. It's also a tactile experience. I felt. Yeah very like I, like I had just picked up a back issue the, there's like a double cover too there's like the you know the, the regular cover on the front you open it up and then there's the a, America's best cover right underneath it 
How did it feel uh, being one of only, I think, three artists to draw all of the or most of the characters in ABC? I don't know. It's like I don't really think like that. Yeah. You know, it's it just happened. You know, it's you're in the midst of this thing, and you know, people call and say, "Will you do this?" and you jump into it. There's no real plan to it all. I'm afraid. Okay. Um, and uh, you, you. So that last one, it, I thought it was really fun you had tom strong doing this riddle thing and um it's like a callback to those old justice league comics i thought oh yeah yep very fun and then finally yep. you did um you did a to z um how that, that was with, break out yeah that was with steve moore and yeah, he's another steve. fantastic writer who i think suffered from being so close to alan um but having the same a, last name <laughs> i know i know um uh He's passed away too, which is uh, sad. But um, he he's another guy who's able to structure a story. So it's like perfectly structured. Just like, you know, a song can be perfectly structured. Mm -hmm. He had that ability to make a story like that. And, uh, you know, that last one I got to work on was like that, I thought. How did the splash work its way into the dynamics of ABC? Well, I was running comiccon.com. It was the very beginning of the web era. So we were just trying to figure out how to keep people coming to the site day by day. And so it made sense for us to start a little news site. And it began with me finding news items on the internet that were about comics and stuff like that. And one of the stories I was following was the Marvel bankruptcy, which was in like the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. So I could write a little news story and, and keep comic fans up to date about it. Out of the blue, I received a package from somebody uh, who worked for Marvel and had received a severance deal. And they were being sued by the Marvel investors to get that money back. So I had this headline. I had the proof of it, the documents. And I had this headline, Marvel sues freelancers. And so the splash blew up on the internet. It was like the perfect clickbait. Before there was a word for clickbait. Word, word, yeah. clickbait. And the story developed and we built this following. And all of a sudden I got approached by a lot of people embedded in the industry who were pissed off at what DC and uh, Diamond had done by just basically monopolizing the direct sales market. Mm -hmm. they, they were pissed. They were really mad that this beautiful thing we had all worked to build had been taken by these greed heads. And so all of a sudden I had people feeding me information about what was going on inside Marvel, DC, Diamond, Dark Horse, and the rest of them. Okay. And I was... It, and, and the splash became kind of like the Drudge Report, it, where like a couple times a week I'd have this you know bombshell story about what Levitz was doing or what was going on at Marvel and stuff like that. And so um, they were frantic; they didn't understand how I was able to find out what was going on inside. And to this day, I can never reveal the names of the people who spoke to me because I promised them I never would. But I had insiders telling me exactly what was going on at Marvel and DC. And so this created this insane dynamic, especially with Paul Levitz, because we were like ahead of him all the time in terms of the deals he was doing with Diamond. Um, he was pulping magazines. You know, it was like, it was crazy, absolutely crazy dynamic. And for ABC, uh, would that put you in an awkward situation? Because it was totally for awkward, but it was totally awkward. But at the same time, no one called me on it. Um, <laughs> it wasn't like you know they called up and said you're not working for us anymore. Um, and maybe it was because I was working for IDW or, or working for ABC, excuse me, yeah. um, which had, was supposed to be off to the side of DC Comics. Um, so it just kind of went on and. Um, they, they uh, to this day they don't know how i did it and uh how do you feel about seeing that now in 2021 with dc breaking away from diamond and you know you're talking um, about the marvel well, bankruptcy i'm kind of seeing similar signs yeah, of the dc, yeah, with DC yeah, well, yeah. 
you know, it's the end result of some really bad decisions that were made to, to make short-term profits back in the day. And it's like the people who run the businesses uh, in comics are not thinking about the art form. They're thinking about the next two quarters and how they're going to make money and explain why they're, why they're making money or not to the people above them and beyond. It's out of their hands, really. So um, we're, my goal has always been to promote the art form, to explore the art form, to feed the art form. Um, and um, maybe the collapse or the semi-collapse that we're watching now is actually a good thing because maybe new ways to get comics from creators to readers will develop. I think um, in terms of uh, moving up the art form, I think you've absolutely succeeded. I think you're one of the <laughs> great innovators of comics, so. Well, thank you, thank you. I just, I'm a lifer, I'll tell you that. I've been doing it since I was a little kid, so you know, it's forever. And, uh, if you had the chance to so at this particular moment um there is there is a, a a rumor going around and i don't buy into it at all but there's a rumor going around that dc might be selling its properties if you had a chance to get gray shirt back could you happily do more gray shirt yeah i would i, I mean i would do more gray shirt for dc if they wanted to and i think they should do a collective gray shirt I agree. To me, material would be a great book and to do more material, but um, Alan will never be part of it, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind if, you know, I ran with it. Yeah. I mean, clearly you can, you can do gray shirt on your own. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, the whole comic industry is in under threat right now. So um, it's probably best for everybody to wait and just see where everything lands because it's all shaking apart. Um, we're all watching Diamond going like, wow, are they going to be able to survive with no DC Comics? Um, and if they can't survive, what happens? Does do, do Marvel not survive then? So uh, the companies that now control DC and Marvel are these, you know, AT&T yeah, and, Disney. and Disney and, you know, the comic book publishing is this little infinitesimal nothing to them. So it, it's a bad time for comics right now, a very bad time. I saw a thing on the internet the other day that this month's Marvel comics, 37% of them were Spider-Man and this month's DC comics, 33% of them were Batman. And I bet the other 33% is, is Superman. Yeah, but it's, they've forgotten the art form. And I think people like Alan and I and Dave and, you know, all these guys who love comics, we love it as an art form. And uh, we look to Will Eisner, who was an inspiration, who walked around, went around telling us, this is a real thing. You've got to grow it and nurture it and explore it. And um, it's, while it's theoretically possible to do something interesting at Marvel or DC, um, in in reality, it doesn't really happen. You know, they're they're doing the house stuff over and over over again. They're trying to um, sell to a market that's shrinking day by day. So I think it'll be a while before it all sorts out. And I'm makes me happy that I've got my own thing going. Yeah. With Panel Vision and are the Maxim Yeah. You know, are there self plans for more Panel Vision books? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to stop until they take the pencil from my cold dead hand. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, with, with all the stuff we've we've talked about so far, there's five panel vision books out. You can get them on Amazon, either uh, on your Kindle or, which is also there, you can get a Kindle reader for for a desktop. Um, and you can also get Gray Shirt Indigo Sunset from BrickVeach.com. But true. speaking of to, you know, just to close us off, just speaking of comics being an art form, are you following any uh, comics artists right now? W Not really. Like to um, signal boost anyone or? Um, I would love to if I was more in touch with it. Um, okay. I see beautiful art on the internet, but the nearest comic book store is 100 miles away from where I live because they've all closed, any of them that were closer. So 
I don't get to go in and browse anymore. Oh. And I'm not the kind of person who wants to do a pull list and get the same crap, you know, month after month. I'm looking for interesting stuff. And there's no conventions. That's mm -hmm. where I used to pick up interesting, you know, the fanographic stuff I could find at a convention. So I'm pretty much out of touch with everything except what I'm doing. What's the last comic book that you read? I'm just curious. What's the last comic book you read that blew you away? Boy, I can't remember. It's, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while? Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, Mr. Veach. This was, this was great. I really appreciate awesome. you coming back on the show. And thanks for doing what you do, getting the word out. <clears throat> I think these uh, Zoom things really you know, work to help promote comics. And a lot of people are interested in this stuff now. So keep up the good work. Thank you so much.